Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. Matthew, how are you today? I am well, sir. How are you? Good, thank you. So, Matthew Gardner, he's a chief economist for Windermere Real Estate, and he's responsible for analyzing and interpreting economic data and its impact on the real estate market. On both at local and national level, Matthew has over 30 years of professional experience in US and UK. Would you like to add anything to the, that, Bio? <laughs> uh, I, I, one, clearly I am old. Um, <laughs> I guess anything I would no, add. No, that, that's not all. That's called experience. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the chief economist for Windermere Real Estate, uh, and Windermere is a privately held company. We uh, we represent well. We've got about 320 offices in 10 Western states. Oh wow! And our brokers sell roughly about 37 billion dollars worth of houses every year. That's amazing. I did not know that before I reached out to you. <laughs> that's okay. So, uh, of course, you mentioned what you do. Do you also personally invest in real estate? I do, but um, I tend to take an arm's length view. Uh, I've got not enough time to do it personally. So I, I have significant, well, I have investments in various real estate investment trusts. Oh, so, okay. Uh, the investment oh, REITs, uh, uh, again, is something which I, I've had, and I've had them for many, many, many years. Right. So I tend to take an, an arm's length position. There's some REITs which I like, and... Uh, They've done very well for me over the years. That's awesome. So uh, when you say that you are the chief economist at the Windermere Real Estate, so what, what is your role? What do you have to do? Well, I've got a kind of pretty open role. Um, <laughs> my, I, I've got one job, and that is, I mentioned earlier, we have a little more than 6,700 brokers. Um, and the furthest east we are is Utah and Colorado. Okay. As far north as, uh, as the... Uh, the border with Cal with Canada to the north and San Diego. Oh, okay. To the south. So um, we are pretty expansive as a, as a private company. My job, quite frankly, is to make sure that all of our owners uh, and all of our agents are as knowledgeable as possible uh, about what's going on, not only in the economy, which is obviously very important, but certainly the housing market. Right. Um, both again nationally uh, as well as regionally as well as locally. Right. So uh, obviously, we all know all real estate is is local. Right. So, uh, my, so my job is to make our, our, our agents and our brokers as smart as possible. Okay. So, so your agents and brokers mainly focus in the residential housing market, I presume? Yeah, we do. A vast majority is real estate um, transactions, well, uh, sales. However, we have a relatively small commercial department oh, okay. and, and single family residential as well in terms of rentals. Awesome. But most, most of it is actually sales. Perfect. And I'm going to ask you questions about overall economy. Uh, so uh, one of the question I have had from some of my listeners is what is the average FICO scores are and what that tells us about the state of the real estate market? Right. Um, right now, hi. Uh, the last numbers that I have coming out, of, I track Ellie May. Okay. Uh, Ellie May puts out a, a very robust analysis every month yeah. uh, on average FICO scores for FHA conventional loans. Uh, and where they stand today is the average FICO score in February uh, for a conventional loan, a closed loan, was 755. Wow. And for an FHA loan, it was 678. Okay. So uh, still, still pretty high. Right, right. And what that tells us about the state of the overall market. Right. I, mean, I think it, it, <laughs> the obvious thing is, uh, is a direct comparison to where we were before 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, 2008 had these no doc loans, low, uh, low doc <laughs> ninja yeah. loans, my yep. Favorite, yep. no income, no job or assets. Uh, and credit quality obviously was remarkably low. Uh, if you had a heartbeat, you could get a mortgage. Right. Obviously, post 2008, it's become remarkably tight. In fact, I would argue we've actually moved from one extreme to the other. We've gone from anyone qualifying to it becoming remarkably difficult right. for a mortgage. So credit quality is it's not as high as it was in 2012. It's come down very slightly, but it is still very robust and very high. So same way, what, uh, what is the average down payment right now? And where does it fit in the historical con contracts? Uh, well, again, it's difficult to go pick back historically. Obviously, there's so many different data providers when it comes to looking at down payments. Most of them come out with very different numbers. But the best way, the most recent data that I've got actually comes from the National Association 
of realtors and their annual survey on home buyers. Uh, and they said basically for all buyers, the median down payment was 12%. Okay. And it varied, obviously. <clears throat> First time buyers, it was lower, it was 6%. Right. For repeat buyers, it was higher at 16%. Right. So, that makes uh, and, sense. Again, right. So, what is, where are we, where do we stand historically? And again, you've got to go back to, to the pre recession days. Uh, and basically, people were taking out 105% mortgages. Right. Um, my, my all-time favorite was the zero down option arm with cash back at closing. Yeah, that, uh, those, those were the worst ones. <laughs> uh, what, what could possibly go wrong? Right. Uh, so again, no, so what we've seen uh, is that loan payments, certainly <sighs> house, sorry, not loan payments, down payments have increased substantially from where we were a decade or so ago. And that's interesting because what you notice, it be, get, because we put down far higher down payments, is that once we came out of the recession, our mortgage debt really has not risen. Uh, in fact, mortgage debt today for the country as a whole is roughly where we were uh, back in 2008. Wow. We, and so given that, because of our far higher down payments, right. not adding on to our mortgage debt and home prices increasing, means one thing. We're sat on over $18 trillion in equity. Wow. That is a massive, if you look at the That's whole amazing. value of every, every home in America, it's roughly a bit north of $29 trillion. We are sat on, on a mass amount of equity. That's crazy. So, uh, and have you been following the trade war uh, US had with China and of course Europe? Still and, and, yes. So, um, what do you think of the trade war and what would be the impact on overall real estate? Well, there's a couple of ways you have to look at it. You have to look at it of what it was like up until about six weeks ago. Right, um, yeah. And, and where things are. <laughs> things <today>. have changed. <laughs> oh, boy. So I'll be just saying, here's what I, I believe. I believe that we are in a staring match with China mm -hmm. and we're not going to win. Right. Uh, and here's why I, I, I believe that's the case. So, well, there's several reasons. The first one is that China, historically, it plays the long game. Um, mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? They can lose money this year, next year, five, right. ten years from now. Right. They don't care. They think about the world and what's going on in the next 20, 50, 100 years from now. And also, remember this, uh, President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping is president for life. He's going nowhere. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah, we as a nation work in four-year increments between elections. Right. Now, Navarro came out recently and obviously with waving this paper saying we have a phase one trade agreement in place. Isn't life great? Well, I, I actually read it uh, and the answer is no, it's not. Uh, and here's a good example <laughs> for that. He put out there, you know what, China's going to buy $34 billion worth of agricultural products from America over the course of the next two years. Sounds great, right? Right, no of course. Ah, but, <laughs> and here's the but. <laughs> The amount they've agreed to buy the next two years is the same amount they bought in one year in 2014. Oh. <laughs> this is no improvement. Right. So given that, you can say, isn't it great, but quite frankly, let's look back historically, compare it to where we were, and have we actually made any progress? Now, don't get me wrong. I think I, I certainly have significant issues with China relative to intellectual capital, uh, and right. these things, and, and I get that, and those things absolutely need to be addressed. However, we as a nation have moved away from being a goods producing nation into becoming a services. Uh, yep. Now, when you move away, we've been moving away, for example, from manufacturing right. since the 1980s because it's becoming, quite frankly, too expensive to create that widget uh, in the US, a lot mm -hmm. cheaper overseas. Absolutely. So so having a trade imbalance isn't necessarily a bad thing. We are a nation of consumers. Yep. Our economy does yeah, we consume. We, we, yeah, 70% yeah. <laughs> of the US economy is consumption. So well, as we're doing that, that's okay to have that trade imbalance. And so uh, I think it's very short-sighted uh, to, to look at where we are today. So I don't really think it's going to win. Now, ultimately, what do I believe is going to occur? I think obviously this phase one, whatever agreement was made, I, I personally think that China is now going to sit and wait. They're going to wait until after November to see who's going to be in the world. Right, that's the key. <laughs> and, and, and at that point, whoever it is, 
uh, they could reopen negotiations again. Uh, but quite frankly, I think this is something that Navarro uh, has been running. He wanted to have his trade war. He's got it. Uh, and, and personally speaking, I think it's, uh, it's short-sighted and, and somewhat naive. Awesome. So, of course, that, uh, and you brought it up, that things have changed in last six weeks, and I do want to focus on this podcast on the coronavirus as well. So, of course, we have seen, and you are in Seattle, right, which was the mm -hmm. hardest hit when, you know, we started seeing this started epidemic. Here, yeah, yeah well, and now, of course, it's New York City, but again, not taking any city. It's overall U.S. So I think at this point, we need to be locked down. Yes. Uh, India just today announced 21 days lockdown. That's huge for a country that size. Oh, a population. People, I mean, and, and yeah, and, and, and right. Shutting, shutting it down in, the, in a similar manner that China shut down. Exactly. Uh, for the entire country. Uh, so I think as a country, in, you know, we got to do that sooner than later because uh, the cases are climbing like crazy. So, um, and, and, you know, uh, of course, uh, I, I can see that what, what would what could happen to economy and whatnot. But what do you see uh, would uh, this coronavirus pandemic would impact uh, on global and U.S. economy? Yeah. Well, OK. Uh, wow. It's a very broad question. Like, I'll try and answer it. <laughs> broad, broadly, if you think about the planet as a whole, um, we were we had already seen a global economic slowdown. That was no. occurring. already occurring in South America, Argentina, Brazil. Yes, yeah. that's Obviously. been there for a while. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Europe slowing down dramatically, yeah. mainly in Spain, uh, Portugal, France, and Italy. Greece. Uh, yeah. And Greece, right? The old pigs, right? Portugal, Italy, Ireland. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So we've seen that occur. Uh, and even a slowdown uh, in Asia, uh, in China. Right. Yeah. And, and the scary thing, quite frankly, is a slowdown in Australia. Yeah. Why, why is that unusual? Australia hasn't had a recession in over 27 for, years. Yeah, for a long, long time. Long I was time. reading about it. <laughs> right, so they were slowing down because of their exposure, obviously, to, to the Asian markets. Okay. So we were at a point before uh, the pandemic, before COVID-19 kicked in, of slowing down anyway. This is certainly going to exacerbate that. There's no Yes, question. this is a catalyst, right? It means there was fire was about to start and this thing's going to just burn it down, right? Right, right. So... Uh, is it going to have a negative impact? Sure. Uh, are we virtually on a, a global recession? It would not surprise me uh, okay. if that happens. Now, when it comes to the U.S., I think a recession, in my opinion, is a given. Yes. Uh, but the question is, what is the shape of the recession? Now, what do I mean by that? Is it going to be a V-shaped recession? Where it's sharp uh, down okay, it's very and sharp and then comes back up, right, right. back up. Or, is or it's it a new U. A U-shaped recession, you go down, you hang around a bit. Right. Or the worst case scenario, an L-shaped recession. Oh. And L-shaped recessions are you drop down and then you kind of uh, you kind of go the way of Japan in the 19th. Wow. You essentially don't grow for a decade. Yeah, yeah, forever, pretty much. I haven't right. seen Japan back up for a long time. Right. So, so we have that situation. Now, <laughs> what do I think? Um, I believe at least at a U.S. level, a country level, more than likely it'll be a V-shaped mm. recession. Uh, and here's what, now, point off the bat, is it going to be a recession? Sure. Uh, the second quarter of this year, in terms of GDP, is going to be ugly as all heck. Right. <laughs> I'm expecting a contraction uh, on an annualized basis of somewhere between 12 and 15 percent. Wow. I think it's either, I think it's JP Morgan have come out um, and said they wouldn't be surprised to see a 30, 3, 0 percent Ooh. drop uh, in GDP in Q2. Now, that I think we can pretty much uh, assure it's, it's going to be a drop to yes. whatever we, degree. That all of us know now. <laughs> given the fact that <laughs> the second quarter starts next week, right? So we know it's going to happen. Yeah. The question is going to be coming out of it. I think, to, uh, I think we will see a recovery in the second half of the year. No, oh, yeah, okay. I am personally a little more pessimistic. I think it's going to take a bit of time to get buyers back out in their normal, traditional spending oh, yeah. and travel habits. Travel is yes. important. Travel and entertainment, right? They're the Absolutely. hardest thing. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, therefore, I would expect to see a further contraction in the third quarter, but far more modest, probably okay. somewhere between 3 and 4%. And then in Q4, really seeing probably annualized somewhere around 4% growth uh, in the country. So, 
from a technical standpoint, is it a recession? Yes, it is. Yeah. I think that what, what we need to remember is the economy was doing okay in the first two months of the year. We were adding right. on roughly, roughly 230, 240,000 right, jobs 200. per month. <laughs> uh, inflation really wasn't there. Um, we were looking pretty good. Yeah. Now, when this happened, uh, obviously it hit the equity markets massively. And it oh, pretty bad, yeah. As if the stock, I mean, thousand point swings in the Dow, a thousand yeah. new one. Thousand see like nothing. <laughs> so I'm looking at the market today. Even uh, today, you know, yeah. And that's oh, like about eight point one percent. Yeah. Um, so, but these wild swings, and, and that does make sense. So obviously, uh, if you look at equities, we're down about thirty two percent from peak. So, why is that important? Well, that does tend to drive consumer sentiment and how we feel and how we feel about going out spending money. So we see a lot of people, they're looking at their 401k, 401k plans. And what I would caution all of your readers the next couple of months, all your listeners, is that when, uh, when they get their statement through every month, uh -huh. don't open it. <laughs> your, your hand to the shredder uh, right. is going to be the way to go because it'll just depress you. However, uh, certainly in listening to other people in the finance industry who are a lot smarter than me, um, they're saying that you know, once we, this virus gets addressed, and it will get addressed. Yes. But so, uh, they're looking at, at share prices now. We went from a market, an, an equity market that was overbought in January and right. February to significantly oversold today. Uh -huh. So uh, I think the upside, and some are saying we could see a 40% upside fit pretty quickly uh, in equities, uh, just, which would get us back not quite to where we peaked uh, five or so weeks ago, but pretty close to it. So a recession, wow. yes. Global slowdown, absolutely. <clears throat> but the point being is, I think, both from a global and certainly a U.S. standpoint, we all knew that a recession was going to happen. We are 10 and a half years into economic expansion. Right. That's the longest expansion cycle we have That's seen. So. The average time between recessions is five and a half years. We, we yep. uh, so it was going to happen. But what no one understood, or no one knew rather, including myself, is what's the exogenous, what's the outside shock that's mm. going to push us? I mean, recessions don't just happen. Right. Oh, 07, it was housing, 2000.1.coms. Right. Before that, it was S&P. Before that, it was energy, blah, blah, blah. So I think we weren't sure what the screen. Now we know, obviously, what it was. It was this little mm -hmm. bug. Uh, however, the robust nature of the U.S. economy in February can, cannot be dismissed. So That's true. We've overcorrected. I think, and I, I believe it will be essentially a V-shaped recovery. I think this first half of the year is going to be ugly. And I think we'll peak on unemployment likely around... July time at about six and a half. Percent. Yeah, which makes sense, right? Because it takes three, four months. Uh, yeah, and then you see uh, the And the second half is going to be a significant improvement. Oh, okay. Keeping my fingers crossed. Here we go. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that, that was a great answer. Um, so, of course, you know, I wanted to talk about the economy, but of being a real estate investor and you are in real estate as well, what is the impact on U.S. real estate market? And of course, I'm going to drill down as well because I would like to know more about Washington and California as well. <laughs> but what do you think of U.S. real estate just after this coronavirus? Here's what I'd say the problem we have. This is a health-induced issue, mm -hmm. not a housing-induced right. issue. So get your H's right. Um, it is also housing. I am of the opinion that the housing market was very robust coming okay. into this uh, and will be robust coming out of it. Now, all markets obviously are not created equal. Right. I have been worried for about the last year and a half now when it comes to housing, only about one issue, housing affordability. Affordability. And that's the that's key right. in the coastal market or the Western, so. Western yeah. US, right? <laughs> no, uh, I'm not, I'm, am I worried about Ohio? No, I'm not. No. Uh, yeah. Illinois, absolutely. But, but housing affordability is the problem. And that's no question. That's the issue. But when it comes to it, think about it this way. As we've already talked about, credit quality uh, on loans the last several years coming out of this, so the market bottomed across the country in 2012 from a price point standpoint. Uh, and improving significantly for several years. We saw price growth slow the last couple of years. That makes me happy. Mm -hmm. But we were very highly qualified. Our down payment activity was very, very high. Okay. Um, we are sat on massive amounts uh, of equity. 
no one is going to be mailing the keys to their home back to the bank, which is what no, we saw. Of course not, yeah. And we saw that then because people were underwater on their mortgages. Yes. Uh, that's not the case anymore. We have significant levels of equity. We are not building, quite frankly, anything like the amount of housing that's needed for the country. Right. And because of that, we're creating new owner households. Where are they going to live? And as right. they yeah. come into the market, and they will, and please don't underestimate millennials, they are going to be a massive, massive component of the ownership housing market for the next decade. Really? Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. They, they, they're huge. Yeah, and they really are. So given that um, we're well qualified, we've got a lot of equity, and the fact that FHA, Fannie and Freddie have come out with mortgage forbearance temporarily, mm -hmm. you lost your job because of the coronavirus, call up your mortgage service provider. You can't just quit paying a mortgage. Call them right. up. Uh, and they have a lot of plans in place, <coughs> which most importantly, you can stop making your mortgage payments for a period, and then you start up again uh, within a year. But the most important thing is this, it will not negatively impact your credit. Right, that's, that's not, very important. Yep. They'll not report it to the credit reporting agencies. So, and in addition, now this is a, a double-edged sword and it's this, where are we seeing most job losses? They're coming in the leisure and industry yep. and retail sectors, retail, yep. exiting out grocery and online. The trouble with that is, is very simple. Most of these people that are losing their jobs are not homeowners, they're renters. Yeah. It, I think this whole thing is going to and I was, significantly impact the rental market. I was going there only that, because I'm a real estate investor, I own single family through small multifamily and I'm a syndicator or partner in a large multifamily building. So what will be the impact on the rental market and what would that happen? Let's say if my tenants stop paying my rent, of course, at some point, I won't be able to pay my mortgage. So yes, yeah. there may be some snowball effect. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. What, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, and there could be. I am not aware yet uh, that either Fannie, Freddie or FHA have come out with a program for either institutional investors or syndicate investors or uh, basically buyers of essentially second homes that they're renting out, right. depending on how you're financing it. Airbnbs. So, yeah, right, right, right. So I, I'm looking at it and I'm not aware so far. However, it would not surprise me to see uh, the, the government step up. And, and here's why. In a similar way that HUD is saying that, that we're not going to kick people out of homes for failure to pay their rent, uh, we're not going to see evictions, at some point they've got to think, yeah, there's a significant number of homes that people are renting that are privately held that you could arguably kick those people out because they're not paying their rent. Yeah. And that's what they don't want. So if we're addressing evictions in one hand, shouldn't we also be addressing evictions in the other? Okay. Now, on the commercial side of the equation, what we are hearing is that um, you've got uh, people who own office buildings, for example, and let's say they can't, their tenants are, are not in their offices because just they're not allowed to be. So right. they still have to pay their rent. Now that the tenant might say, I can't use this, therefore I shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> is there an obligation? Sure. But what we are seeing a lot of is landlords saying, okay, I get it. You can't pay for a few months. What we will do is we will extend the term of your lease so right. you can get that money back. Uh, uh, but at the same time, however, they're either going to have to continue to pay the debt if they have any on that building. Uh, and possibly that might be the case for the time being for individual investors who will make that, that debt payment, but extend that lease period out, so at least they can recoup that money further down the road. Uh, but in terms of, uh, has the federal government stepped up? I'm not aware no. yet of any program that's already in place. Got it, thank you. So now let's talk about coastal markets or the Western US markets, right? Where we know Seattle or yeah. you know, overall Washington and of course, California has gone up three, four times since 2008 recession. In last year and a half, I was seeing some slowdown and I was actually happy that it's finally, because yeah, the same thing I was worried about is the affordability, right? If right. people cannot buy a house, of course, they can't even rent. You know, the rent is for a one bedroom house in San Francisco Bay Area goes from 3,000 to 6, 7,000, right? So most of the people, over 3, good luck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Most of the people can't afford. So 
uh, what do you see the coronavirus uh, impact on uh, you know real estate market here in you know California? Uh, again, I, I think it's remarkably <laughs> stable now. Obviously, you look at the least affordable housing markets in America. Where are they? Well, number one is Los Angeles. Number two is San Francisco. Of course. <laughs> However, believe it or not, I believe that the top 14 least affordable housing markets are all in California. California, correct. I think, I think it's either 15 or 16, you have to go out of California, and that's Maui. Um, yeah. So uh, again, affordability is a big issue. Uh, and obviously, you know, you've had those issues in California for some while. Well, yeah. There's a lot of reasons why that's the case. Uh, and I think I would argue one of the biggest issues that you have down in, in your area uh, are property taxes and, yes. how they're, and how they're calculated. And you can only raise them <laughs> on a separate year. I'm sure many of your, your listeners already know this. So what essentially that's done is that's keeping people in place. It's not allowing them to move. Right. That's, that's, that's true. A big, big <laughs> problem. So we know that's in place. Now, however, at the same time, so what are we seeing because of that? We've already have seen, obviously, we know California lost, what, a quarter of a million people last year? Correct. Um, Mike, where do they go to? They all moved to Seattle. Seattle, Texas, some of and those Texas were, yeah. <laughs> so we're finding people jump, they're jumping on I-5 and they're coming up, uh, yes. up north and up to my neck of the woods. <laughs> Why are they coming here? <laughs> it's the most interesting thing, and certainly from the Bay Area, Seattle is cheap. Yeah, when you compare to Bay Area. <laughs> it's a 50% discount. Our housing prices are half that. At the Bay Not Area. anymore. Apartment <laughs> rents are half that at the Bay Area. Office space is half that. Right. So they come up here. Now, obviously, not all coming to Seattle. Some are going to Oregon, some are going to Texas. Yeah, Texas is so, huge. Florida, there are lots of, and Raleigh and Durham markets also. Right, right. Yeah. So, however, a lot are coming up here. Now, they're moving out. Obviously, they're moving to areas where they, where they believe the economy is robust. Now, and certainly, if, for example, if you're a technology worker in the Bay, in San Jose, Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco, a lot of you guys are coming up here. Because yeah. it, certainly it is a tech hub. Amazon, Microsoft, Expedia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Huge, exactly. Yeah. So I come here, and again, because because it's cheap. And right. so that actually has led, uh, we, we've benefited from people moving out of the Bay Area. But when we talk about the coronavirus and the impact on the Western United States, negligible in the longer term, I tend to okay. think about housing, not just on a month over month basis. It's silly right. to do that. Yeah. But you look at areas whereby you have an educated workforce, You've got a robust job growth market. There's decent diversification in employment. Uh, and certainly the Western US has that. Colorado has been benefiting dramatically yes. up until recently because of the energy sector. Okay. Uh, and that's been a, a growth market in Denver. But they aren't even themselves starting to come across some issues with housing affordability there. Now, we look at Oregon, sorry, Oregon. we look at Washington, certainly the Puget Sound, look at Northern California. Uh, and yeah, we are doing well, and we've seen some very robust ho house price growth. But I do question the long-term sustainability of that. And here's why I said, imagine you are a company owner, and you're thinking about expanding in San Francisco, in Seattle. What are the two things you think about, first and foremost, when you're thinking about growing? Well, first thing is this. Is there a talented workforce? Correct. And higher? Of course. Well, yeah, you guys down there, you're wickedly smart. Uh, we're pretty smart up here as well. Yeah. <laughs> the second thing you look at is this. How much do I have to pay people? Exactly. <laughs> and the biggest component of salaries is what? Yeah. Cost of living. Cost of living, yeah. So at what point a company is going to say, I've got to pay people how much? Yeah. Well, at that <laughs> point, markets like Spokane, Washington, Boise, Idaho, That's, yeah. Las Vegas, Nevada, yes. become of interest. Now, why those three markets? Why am I choosing them? Well, in all three of those markets, you can buy a brand new, never lived in single family home for 200. 200, exactly. 200, 300, yeah. <laughs> so I think we need to be very careful that we are doing remarkable, have been doing remarkably well up until now. But how much longer can we continue to grow when housing is as unaffordable as it is. Now, affordability in, in, in Seattle, about 44% as opposed to what, sub 10% in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still not good. It's still <laughs> Actually speaking, we're about 65. So uh, I, I think it's something we need to do, we need to look at. Now, why is housing as unaffordable? If you look at the Western United States and certainly the three West Coast markets, it's because we have significant 
geographic constraints. We have a lot that of water, true. yes, a lot of mountains, yep. and certainly here in Seattle, a woefully inadequate mass transit infrastructure. Correct. So that means you limit land. Now, when you limit land topographically, we, we can't change that. Uh, the, the gods nope. created it, nope. it is what it is. <laughs> However, at the same time, we also have geopolitical constraints. We have urban growth boundaries, we have growth management, uh, yep. which is basically at the state level in Washington, state level in Oregon, and at the, uh, the county level in, in California, that defines where you can and where you cannot build. Now, in Washington, for example, because I'm more familiar with it up here, you have these boundaries. Outside of these boundaries, you can build one house per five acres or one house per 20 acres. Uh, so, yeah. you, so you've artificially limited land. You have net new demand, people moving in. That pushes up land prices dramatically, and that impacts housing affordability. So we're in a situation right now whereby uh, I think the economies in the, in the Western US and certainly in the three West Coast states doing well, although we are seeing some slowdown in economic growth in California, don't get me wrong, we are. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, we need to figure out how builders can build housing that people can afford, because quite frankly, most builders are building to the luxury sector. Still, oh yeah, in my area, same thing. Right, because of the fact <laughs> it's where they can make money, because there's yep. land prices go up, labor prices go up, material costs mm -hmm. escalate, and regulatory costs jump up. I mean, 25 cents of every dollar it costs a builder to build a home in America are regulatory fees. Correct. <laughs> so uh, I think we're very lucky. Uh, however, I am actually looking forward to seeing price growth slow in our respective markets down into that mid single digit area, which I think is sustainable. Certainly yeah. for Seattle, it's about a 25 year average. Um, but it's certainly we, we've got to pull back from where we were uh, up until a couple of years ago. Right. I hope so. <laughs> so let's, let's change and we'll move on to the quick tips, tips round. Uh, any real estate or finance books you recommend? Uh, that's an interesting thing when I saw that question earlier on. Uh, I actually teach at the University of Washington. Um, awesome. Uh, <laughs> and for me, it's not necessarily a book. What I would think uh, a book that I still use is Friedman's book. It's, it's called The uh, Di uh, Dictionary of Real Estate Terms. Oh, um, it's published. It's Barron's Business Dictionaries. Um, I'm going to take the note. <laughs> and you should. The reason being is that there's so much language revolving around real estate, both from an investment standpoint and just a, um, uh, anyone interested in, in real estate. There's a lot of words we use and a lot of them people don't understand. Right. Uh, and here's a good example of this. When the Federal Reserve says it's reduce, reducing the Fed funds rate down to a range of zero to a quarter point, I'm getting phone calls from people yes. saying, my mortgage rate's going to I need to refi. <laughs> a lot of my friends reached out to me. Oh, hey, can you suggest a lender? I need to refi. I said, don't worry about it right now. Right. Uh, and this dictionary is great because it does go into an explanation of mortgage rates and how they're created. And we all know, I'm sure your, readers, your listeners know, uh, mortgage rates track yield on 10-year treasuries, bottom yeah. line. So, uh, and so it's not a case of it's a straightforward dictionary, although that's what it is, but it does have some great, I carry this with me everywhere. Oh, nice. Okay. My ninth edition of it, I, think I, I use it a lot. Uh, and I think that that is very useful when you start hearing uh, a lot of words that are being used out there and what they mean, but also an explanation. Uh, it's, I think it's a great little book to carry around. Okay. So that's what I would uh, I'd recommend. I'm going to buy it for sure. <laughs> So any website or apps, if uh, someone wants to understand more about interest rates, real estate, et cetera, overall uh, impact? I, I, yeah, I, I think I would, certainly the National Association of Realtors uh, uh -huh. has a good website yeah. um, and they, they produce some decent research, which they share, uh, which you don't need to subscribe to or be a member of. Right. Um, Mortgage News Daily um, is another website which looks purely oh, okay. at the financial markets very robust fact I, I subscribe they send you a daily uh, update okay. that i subscribe to which and and actually the way uh, they they write actually some of the the writers are the authors are, uh, are very interesting they keep it kind of somewhat light um, but fascinating stuff when it comes to where the financial markets are and certainly right now we are in right. really unique times I mean, the Fed is... No busy. one has seen this before. This is something yeah, different. 
castle. I mean, I, I mean, the lectures that I give, I wish I could go back to my old textbooks and say, okay, uh, what happened to real estate during the last pandemic? Yeah. Uh, we've never had one. No before. one knows. <laughs> yeah. uh, at least in terms of, to, to this degree. And so we're, we're really in uncharted territory. So those are two which spring to mind. NAR, I think the National Association of Home Builders, uh, their economics group is pretty impressive as well. Uh, and so I think those are three who I would absolutely be, uh, uh, be referring to regularly because uh, they've got some smart people in, in all three of those entities. Of course. <laughs> they definitely do, uh, know way more than you, we do. <laughs> so thanks again. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the episode. How can my listeners reach out to you? Uh, well, you can follow me on social media, uh, on uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I, I think you go to Windermere Economics on Facebook. And I believe it's Matthew Gardner Econ on uh, um on Instagram, uh, Seattle Econ on Twitter. And so those are the three things that, that uh, I'm now apparently spending more time thinking about those seeing as I'm stuck in my house right now. Of uh, course, everyone uh, is. <laughs> not giving speeches anymore, at least for the time being. It's better to be inside the house than outside right now. And I, I, I haven't I, stepped foot outside in exactly. 10 Exactly. Yeah, me too. And I thank God that we are forced to sit inside while there is no bombing outside, right? So exactly. just comparing it to other part of parts of the world. So, you know, it is what it is. I think we just need to, you know, fight on, right? I agree. I agree. <laughs> Thanks again, Matthew. Take care. You're welcome. Nice visiting with you.